Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Cell Types to Targets Single Cell RNA Sequencing for Drug Discovery. I am Alexis Corrales of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labberts and sponsored by 10X Genomics. For more information about our sponsor, please visit their website at 10xgenomics.com. So let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. I'd like to now introduce our presenter, Dr. Sarah Middleton, computational biologist at GSK. For a complete biography on our presenter, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Middleton, you may, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, my name is Sarah Middleton, and I'm a computational biologist in the functional genomics group at GSK. Today, I'd like to talk about how single-cell RNA-seq can be used for drug discovery, as well as some of the challenges that I think we are having that are preventing us from using this technology to its full potential at the moment. So I've designed this talk with drug discovery in mind, of course, because that is my focus. But uh, I think that the concepts that I'll cover today are really not specific to drug discovery and, in fact, can be really relevant for anyone who's interested in disease biology. So to start, and just to get everyone on the same page, I do want to take a moment to go over the drug discovery pipeline, because I know this is not something that everyone is familiar with. So drug discovery pipeline is not something that is really set in stone, and even within a given company, it can change. It's also changed quite a bit over time, in fact. But I think at least in today's day, this day and age, um, it generally follows this flow. So we'll start off with target identification and validation. This is where we're trying to select a protein that we will eventually target with a molecule that we hope will actually have a therapeutic effect on the disease. Once we have selected the protein, we can then go to compound screening and lead optimization, candidate selection, so on. These are the steps where we are actually trying to select and um, optimize the molecule that will bind to our protein and hopefully have the therapeutic effect, whether it's inhibiting the function of that protein or activating it and so on. Once we have a molecule in hand, we can then move on to preclinical development. And so this encompasses a pretty wide range of activities actually, but mostly geared around trying to better understand the safety of the molecule, uh, the dosing strategy, as well as um, how the molecule is actually interacting with the protein, what is the mechanism of action, and how is modulating the target actually uh, what kind of effect is that actually producing? And so usually this will involve a lot of in vitro and in vivo studies. So once the molecule has passed um, safety standards and seems to be showing at least potential efficacy, we can finally move on to human clinical trials. If it passes this, then it becomes a successful medicine, which is great. Um, and then there will often be a stage of um, post-market research where we'll, you know, look at things sort of, we, uh, are there certain patient populations who are responding better to this treatment or worse? Um, are there other diseases where this molecule might be useful? And things like that. So as I mentioned, I'm a computational biologist, and I think this is a pretty fun job to have in the pharma industry because you get to work across the entire drug discovery pipeline. Really, our job is to work with large data sets, and usually this will be omics data sets, so transcriptome, genome, so on and so forth. And really, we just go wherever the omics data is. Um, this could involve you know, working on things like um, uh, differential expression between disease and healthy, um, analyzing the output of functional screens, doing pathway analysis, network analysis. Sometimes we work on things like biomarker identification and output from clinical trials and things like that. So really a diverse set of things we can do. Um, and in particular, I think transcriptome data, uh, such as microarray and bulk RNA-seq, have become pretty well-established tools in pharma for answering various questions along this pipeline, in particular, 
for target identification, target validation, and preclinical development. Uh, however, I think single cell RNA-seq, on the other hand, is a much newer technology, and we're really just beginning to explore how we can actually utilize it for drug discovery. So what I'd like to do in the first half of my talk is um, just give a very high-level overview of some of the opportunities that I see for single cell RNA-seq and drug discovery. I want to say up front that this will definitely not be a comprehensive review of all the ways that single cell RNA-seq could be used. Um, uh, just for the sake of time, I'm going to focus mostly on you know, my own experiences, which are mostly in the early target discovery space. However, I will at least touch on some examples in later development that I think are particularly exciting. So we'll start at the earliest stages of the pipeline, which is target discovery. So as I mentioned before, the goal of target discovery is essentially to try and identify proteins that, when modulated through a molecule such as an antibody or a small molecule, will produce a therapeutic effect for the disease and also be safe for human use. So, of course, we do have various assays that will allow us, if we have a molecule already, whether to assess if that molecule is likely to be safe and efficacious for a particular disease using you know, various in vitro and vivo models. However, getting to that stage of where we actually have a molecule and then doing all these tests is very time consuming and expensive. And so really our goal in target discovery is to narrow down the field of targets as much as possible so that we're really zeroing in the ones that are most likely to be successful. And that way we can focus our resources and time on just those most likely candidates and hopefully through that get to a medicine more quickly. So then the question becomes, you know, how do we effectively predict what targets are going to be most likely successful for a given disease? So I think you know, there's a huge range of different ways we do target discovery, basically. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on the, you know, the context of bulk RNA-seq and what we've done so far. So generally, you know, in what we might do if we're considering using RNA sequencing as a tool for identifying targets is we might have, say, a healthy a cohort and disease cohort. We do RNA sequencing on them, and we compare them using differential expression. And this can help identify genes that are going up and down in disease and help us understand maybe the pathways that are involved and therefore help us zero in on targets. We may also have within the disease cohort information on disease progression. If we have this, it's really useful because then we can look at how the expression of a given gene is correlated with the disease activity score, or disease progression, so on and so forth. This is useful because it gives us that little bit of extra information that tells us, you know, this gene is actually changing along with the disease progression, and there, therefore maybe modulating that gene will have an effect on the disease progression. Another thing we can do is if we have known disease subtypes, we can also look at the expression of genes across those subtypes, which can help us better understand you know, what was different about these subtypes, um, and depending on how it's set up, it will give us different information about the disease. So now, I, I think for this audience, I don't need to convince you that you know, bulk RNA-seq, while useful, is also limited in the sense that it gives you an average of what is probably a very heterogeneous population of cells in your sample. And really, with bulk RNA-seq, um, you will only identify signals that are either very dramatic. So if you're comparing health and disease, for example, very dramatic changes in expression may show up, or changes that occur in a very dominant cell type that's making up a lot of the sample. You may be able to detect those. However, we're going to miss a lot of things that are more subtle. And so this is where single cell RNA-seq can really help. We can break down this heterogeneous pool of cells into cell types and then look at changes of expression within those cell types. So this can be great when, you know, for most cell types, we're not having a change in a particular gene. It's really only in one cell type that that gene is changing. In addition, we can actually go even further. And this is part of what's great about single cell RNA-seq is because you don't have to define up front, um, you know, all the subtypes that you want to look into. You can go fairly deep um, without having to set up a complex, you know, panel to sort those cells or anything like that. Um, and so we could say um, we think that there's something interesting going on in CD4 T cells. We can actually go even deeper and look at quite a number of subtypes of CD4 T cells. And again, we might see that it's really only one subtype that is showing a change of a particular gene. And this is really powerful because, you know, a lot of these subtypes are quite rare. 
and you really there's no way you're going to see that on a bulk RNA seq sample unless you've enriched it already for what you're what you think you're going to see. But single cell RNA seq gives you the opportunity to look at this in a little bit of a more unbiased manner. So I think this is a really intuitive way of understanding how single cell RNA seq can add value to how we're already using bulk RNA seq in pharma. However, there's actually additional things we can do with single RNA seq that sort of take a different approach altogether. And one of those types of approaches I want to talk about today is a cell type focus strategy. So what we're going to do here is instead of directly trying to identify genes that are changing in disease, we're going to first start by trying to identify the cell types that are changing in disease. Once we've identified those cell types, we can then look within each cell type individually and look for altered pathways and targets uh, between healthy and disease. Um, and then we can pr also prioritize within those pathways. Once we have those two pieces of information, we're really well set up to do our functional assays and validation because we've already identified a cell type that we think is relevant and the pathways and you know mechanistically what we think is going wrong in that cell type, which is really helpful for designing a good assay to test our hypotheses. So I want to go a little bit more into depth into each of these steps. So as you might imagine, a crucial part of this is actually doing a good job of identifying what cell type is relevant to the disease. And there's several different strategies we can take here to do that. I am, this is not going to be exhaustive. There's probably a lot of other creative ways you can do this, but these are just some simple ways that um, you might consider as a first pass. The first method to identify cell types related to disease would be to look at cell changes in cell type proportions. So we can think about those same three experimental, experimental designs I talked about. And now we can try to look at them in the context of changes in cell type fractions or proportions. So if we're comparing healthy versus disease, we might look for cell types that are specific to disease or ones that have expanded or depleted in the disease state. Um, it probably goes without saying, but I think it's important to note that you know just because we see a change in disease and a cell type in disease in terms of its proportion, this doesn't necessarily mean that it's causative of that disease. It just means that that is you know an observation of something that's different in the disease. Um, so we do need to interpret this with care. However, I think this is a really useful way of starting to get at the question of you know what might be relevant. Another thing you always have to think about with proportions is that when one cell type increases in proportion, of course, all the other cell types are going to decrease, right? Because everything has to sum to one. And so it can be a little tricky to pick apart these differences. But nonetheless, I think this is a good first pass to try and figure out, you know, what, what's changing and what is relevant. If you have information on disease progression, again, we can, this is really useful because we can start to look at what cell types um, are sort of expanding along with disease severity or, you know, just changing in proportion along with some sort of measure of severity or progression. Um, again, this can give us a little bit more information on things that maybe, you know, start early in the disease and therefore maybe are more related to causative, uh, more causative for the disease, or maybe things that are just um, tracking with progression and therefore are related to progression. If we have information on disease subtypes, we can directly look at association of the frequency of different cell types with those subtypes. Um, this is great for trying to understand, you know, if if we think there are very distinct subtypes of disease that maybe require different treatments, we can start to look at, you know, uh, what, what are the cell types that might explain those differences and maybe best to target in each of those subtypes. So another approach we can take, let's say we look at our compared disease to healthy and we don't see major changes in cell type proportion. What could be going on is that instead there's a cell type that's changing in its activation state. Um, so we might see, we might look for um, signatures of pathogenic activation that might tell us some more about what is going wrong. Another thing we can do is we can look at cell types that are expressing genes that we already know are associated with disease, say from a GWAS analysis. We can also look just overall what cell types are changing the most in terms of gene expression. Things that change a lot may have something going on that is related to the disease. Now. I think all of these approaches are very powerful because you're bringing in your prior knowledge. But of course, the drawback is you have to actually have that prior knowledge in order to utilize it. Nonetheless, you can see, I'm going to show some examples. You know, if you have some knowledge of, for example, um, signatures that are related to your disease, such as, you know, things that are responding to interferon or a signature of exhaustion, you know, you can overlay this onto your cell types and see what cell types are, you know, showing that change in state. And this might help you zero in on cell types that you think are relevant for the disease. 
If you have GWAS genes already, um, again, this is a useful tool to help you zero in on cell types. You can see you know, which cell types are expressing a lot of those GWAS genes. Um, or you can see if you compare healthy versus disease, are there certain cell types where a lot of GWAS-related genes are changing in expression? So there's just two different ways of kind of getting at that question of, you know, if we have genetic information, can we use that to zero in on the cell type? Another way you can think about this is instead of just looking at individual cells, what might be relevant for the disease is actually interaction between cells. There are a number of more recent methods that actually allow you to start to infer this based on single cell RNA-seq data. Um, and these can be potentially really interesting to help form these hypotheses about pairs of cells or groups of cell types that are, you know, together, um, their interaction is related to the disease progression. We can also look at trajectory analysis, which lets you see continuous sources of variation that might be related to your disease. So whatever method you use, at the end, the hope is that you've arrived at some cell types that you think are related to the disease. And then what you can do is essentially differential expression within that cell type, um, identify things that are changing for that cell type, and then use that as input to pathway network analysis. With, uh, you know, pathway network analysis is, I think, challenging sometimes. It doesn't always produce useful information. But if it does, it's really great because when you have a pathway, this gives you some information about, you know, like mechanistically what's actually going on. And it also gives you an opportunity to do prioritization because you can look within that pathway and say, well, which, you know, if, if I see several places where I can modulate this pathway that I think will have produce a therapeutic effect, uh, I can prioritize the genes that I think um, show favorable characteristics. So in pharma, a lot of the things we look at are things like genetics because it's been shown that genes with genetic evidence, so GWAS signals and so on, for a particular disease are more likely to become successful drug targets. We also look at things like tractability. So is the protein actually something that we think we can target with a molecule? Um, not all proteins are actually amenable to this. So we prioritize based on that. Otherwise, you know, we're really, you can have the best gene in the world, but if you can't actually modulate it anyway, then you're out of luck. We also look at things like um, cell type specificity, Genes that are specific to a cell type or to a tissue tend to be safer because you know, basically you're not going to hit as many things in the body. Um, and then we can also bring in you know, many other types of biological knowledge to help us prioritize. So once you've arrived, oh, sorry, and another thing I think is really interesting, um, just as a note, is that you know you might decide, depending on the cell types you've identified in that seem to be related to the disease, you could go for a direct cell depletion. Um, that, of course, is only um, a good idea for certain cell types, but it's an option that becomes available when you've kind of zeroed in on the cell type you think is relevant. So once you've identified, you know, you have your cell types, you have your pathways and or targets, then, as I said, you're really well set up to do your functional assays and then do that final prioritization and validation of the targets. Um, I think this is really key because having the right functional assays um, and right readouts is really important for actually, you know, getting a good prediction on what targets are going to eventually be safe and efficacious and are more likely to be successful ultimately. So, you know, I'd love to give, you know, examples of how we're using this, but of course it's challenging in pharma to, to share these things at times. But I think there are a lot of good examples in the literature, at least now, that where people have started to improve upon our disease understanding based on cell type information that's gotten from single cell. So for example, um, I'm showing a paper here where they looked at a model of a neurodegeneration and they identified a disease associated microglia subtype. Um, and basically by you know, comparing this disease associated microglia to other microglia, they identified some differentially expressed genes and this helped them understand better you know, how microglia might progress to this disease state and form a hypothesis about how the disease might progress. And you can imagine how this might be useful then for better target hypotheses for drug discovery. Another more recent example um, is a study where they uh, used brain samples from uh, humans, uh, both controls and uh, patients with autism spectrum disorder. They did a decent, uh, pretty deep um, subtyping of their cells and then did differential expression in a cell type specific manner. And they used this then to identify 
um, cell type specific differential express genes that were correlated with the clinical scores for these patients. Um, and then this information was used to try and figure out what cell types were actually most relevant for the disease and might be playing an important role. So just another really interesting way that um, cell type specific information was used. So of course, there are actually many other strategies that we use in target discovery, and I'm just going to touch on two additional ones. So the first is um, functional screen. So here, um, this is where basically we usually use CRISPR or another gene editing technology. We um, create a library that will target various different genes, sometimes the entire genome, and we're going to basically take the strategy of knocking them out one by one and seeing what happens. And so we will usually have some kind of uh, readout um, that will tell us something. You know, the readout has to be designed very carefully to tell us something about how the function of those cells is being altered by the knockout. And so by doing this, we can then hopefully get a sense of what genes are playing a functional role in whatever it is that we're trying to uh, profile. Now you can imagine, in order to get output from this that's actually relevant to your disease, you need to set it up the right way. And I think a key for that, and I think most people agree, is starting with the right cell type. Um, of course, not all cell types can be easily you know, used for a functional screen, but at least if you have you know, taken this cell type first approach and, and tried to identify the cell types associated with disease, um, this can point you in the right direction for the more optimal cell type to do your screen in. Uh, we can also actually directly use single cell now for CRISPR screens, and there are several methods that have been developed that allow you to do this. And the great thing about these approaches is that basically the readout that you get from the screen is the cell transcriptome. And so this is a very rich source of information to better understand the functional consequence of whatever perturbation you've introduced to the cell. Uh, finally, another strategy that I think is very important is the genetics-driven strategy. So this is where you know we start with genetics and then go from there for target identification and prioritization. Um, and you know, like as I mentioned already, you know the reason why this is such a key approach is because it's already been shown uh, several times now that you know, targets with genetic evidence are more likely to be successful drug targets. And so we're enriching basically for success. I think some ways that single cell can help with this approach is basically by allowing you to get more cell type resolution on whatever information it is you're using. So for example, if you're looking at GWAS signals, you can use open chromatin within single cells or different cell types to help narrow your focus to those signals that are most likely to be relevant for cell types that you think are relevant to the disease. You can also do things like single cell EQTLs, as well as cell type derived, uh, sorry, uh, single cell derived regulatory networks, um, which are really interesting. And I think these are these are two areas that are really just um, just beginning to utilize single cell. So keep an eye on those space as they develop. So then I also want to just briefly touch on some ways that we can use single cell RNA-seq and the cell type approach for later development in drug discovery. So one of the really powerful things you can get out of when you actually do a clinical trial is you can profile people before and after treatment. And this can give us a lot of really interesting pieces of information that can help us design, you know, better design our medicines and, and target the right people. So for one thing, you can look at mechanism of action. So you can say, how does a cell, how is this treatment affecting each cell type? Are there any unexpected effects? Are there any cell types that we are not expecting to modulate that we are? You can look at mechanisms of resistance. So if you have people who respond and then people who are not responding, you can see what's different about them in terms of their cell types. Uh, this might suggest combination therapies because if there, you know, we see in the non-responders that there's some sort of other cell type involved, then that might point to, you know, an avenue to develop another uh, treatment for those people, or maybe there's already an existing treatment that you can bring in as a immediate combination therapy. Finally, we can do prediction of response. So we can look at people before they're treated and see what's different about their cell types or just their expression profiles and say, you know, does the abundance of a certain cell type uh, predict response? And can we use that to better, you know, identify the people that are most likely to benefit from a particular treatment? One thing I'm really interested in is how we can use um, single cell and cell type information 
to you know help us better stratify heterogeneous diseases. So I think a lot of diseases are, you know, I, I think it's common knowledge, a lot of diseases are pretty heterogeneous and, you know, they may actually consist really of many subtypes of disease or maybe be sort of a spectrum of disease. One example, and I think, uh, you know, cell type proportions is one way this heterogeneity can manifest. And an example of this is been shown for um, rheumatoid arthritis that there's at least two subtypes of people. Um, there are those that have leukocyte-rich RA, so these are have a high proportion of T cells and B cells. And then there's leukocyte-poor RA, who so have higher proportions of fibroblasts and monocytes. And actually, the leukocyte-poor RA looks a lot more like osteoarthritis than it does leukocyte-rich arthritis, um, rheumatoid arthritis. And so I, I think th this is quite a dramatic difference, and I think it points to the idea that uh, most likely different kinds of treatment would benefit these two different groups of people. And in addition, when we look to, you know, try and develop those treatments, it's important to take into account the actual cell types um, that are present in these people. And, you know, maybe if we look more at subtypes as well, we might get an even better understanding. So what we could do is, you know, we can, again, take cell type proportions and use this to do, you know, unbiased clustering of patients. And this might help us actually do a stratification. And what would be really great is then we can use this information once we've kind of grouped people into slightly more homogeneous populations and subtypes, is then we can do the cell type um, directed approach then on each of those groups individually. So this will give us you know, disease subtype specific cell type information. One caution here is of course, if we're already stratifying based on cell type proportions, we need to be very careful how we use cell type proportion information downstream. We're sort of already stacking the deck in terms of, you know, making these populations as different as possible in terms of their cell types proportions. So you just have to be careful about how you use that. But nonetheless, I think this is a very useful approach. Okay, so now for the second part, I want to take a moment to talk about you know, how some of the challenges that we're facing and, you know, what what might need to be done before we can really make full use of single cell in the ways that I've just discussed. So first, how long does a single cell RNA seq take, analysis take? So I think this is an interesting question to start off with because this is something that I think when people first start doing a single cell, they start planning a single cell experiment, this is not maybe what they're thinking about. Um, I usually warn people that it, for a single cell analysis, you should budget about two months. So it doesn't always take that long, but I find that this is actually usually a pretty good uh, ballpark to make. Um, and so, you know, when I say that, people are often surprised and they ask me, well, what takes so long? So what does take so long? Well, to explain this, I'll go over the steps. So Analysis starts with the data pre-processing. Um, this basically is taking the output from that comes from the sequencer and going through, you know, the steps of aligning reads to the genome and then quantifying different genes. And um, this, the output of this is then your count matrix. So at least in the case of 10x, and I think in really most single cell um, technologies, we have pretty good pipelines for doing this. And so this process is really, you know, it may it may actually take some time just because, you know, it takes, it's a lot of data sometimes, but in terms of, you know, man hours, it's really not very labor intensive and we kind of have this step figured out. The next step is your cell quality control and um, sort of technical effect adjustment. So this step is, I think, absolutely critical for a good analysis. Like this is something that should not be taken lightly. And you really need to get it right, otherwise you can greatly skew your results and your analysis will, you know, not, you know, it's a junk garbage in, garbage out kind of situation. So I, I say we're moving in the right direction here in terms of being able to do this more quickly. Um, although it needs to be done very carefully, we now are more and more having automated methods that allow us to better detect empty droplets, things like doublets. Um, you know, adjusting for technical effects and batch effects and so on. And so we're getting close to being able to have this be a streamlined process. However, I'd say, you know, due to the importance, this is still a step that I take, you know, very carefully and, you know, I don't think it should be rushed through. But now, really, 
the step that takes the most time is this third step, the cell type identification and the downstream analysis. So of course, downstream analysis is always going to be very dependent on whatever your question is. And so in a way, we, you know, there's no way to kind of put that into a pipeline, right? Because it's always going to be different. So the real piece I want to focus on is cell type identification, because this is something that feels like it shouldn't be so hard. It shouldn't take so much time. And it's something we need to do in almost every experiment that we do for single cell. So now you might be thinking, well, I've done cell type identification before. It wasn't that hard. And I'll agree with you if, you know, if all you care about is looking at things on the level of, you know, T cells, B cells, fibroblasts, so on and so forth. Because in general, it's true that those cell types actually do separate fairly well, and we have good markers to identify them. However, of course, there's a lot more to cell types than that. Even within, say, CD4 T cells, we have a huge diversity of different subtypes that might be interesting to look at. But when we try to identify those subtypes, uh, things get a, a lot trickier. Um, it's simply, they simply don't separate out as nicely as the broad cell types do. And oftentimes, the markers we want to look at to identify them, you know, are just not, they're not as useful as we'd like. So this is not to say that that information is not there, that we can't identify subtypes, but simply that it's quite difficult at times and can be very time consuming. However, I think this, uh, despite this, it's absolutely worth looking at cell types, subtypes, and in fact, I think actually critical that we look at subtypes. Um, it's been shown many times already that even within, say, CD4 T cells, uh, there are many subtypes that are specifically involved in different diseases. And just to give an example of asthma, I think it's been shown that several different subtypes of T cells play important roles, and actually uh, many other immune cell types as well, as well as the relative proportions of them and their interactions are all important for the disease understanding. So this is really a level of information that we can't ignore. So, you know, I, I want to emphasize that I think this is definitely something within reach. Subtyping is possible. It's just difficult. And I'll just give one example here. So I'm showing T and NK cells that are from kidney biopsies of patients with lupus nephritis. And so basically, I just took this data set and I tried to see how deeply I could go in terms of subtyping. And you can see I, I got a decent amount of subtypes. So we, we actually can get a pretty good amount of information here. This is going to vary a lot from data set to data set, um, and it depends a lot on the data quality as well. But I think when you have good quality data, subtyping is certainly possible. Now, the other piece of this, though, on the flip side, is that to get to this point took me several days of work and a lot of manual marker examination, so on and so forth. Um, it was not simple. And this was only for the TNNK cells. Then I had to do it for other cell subtypes as well. So you can see how this process starts to take a lot of time. And when you do a lot of single cell analyses, it's a lot of work. Um, but again, you know, I think that this is absolutely something worth doing. It's worth the time because this whole approach of cell types of targets that I discussed depends on having the right resolution of cell type information for your disease. If, for example, you know, you have these two populations of Tregs, and one of them is playing a suppressive role, and the other one has some kind of dysfunction, dysfunctional role, is not behaving right. Um, you know, if you were to lump those together, you might miss out on seeing a signal where one of those cell types might be associated with disease, while the other is not. So you really need to get down to that right resolution in order to see the source of signal. So I've been telling you over and over, you know, cell subtype identification is hard. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you believe me, but I think it's kind of hard to understand why it's so hard until you actually have tried it yourself. So to sort of get you there a little bit, I'm going to try to walk through some examples to demonstrate what makes this such a challenging process. So, you know, um, a lot of the way we do cell type identification is based on known markers. Sometimes these markers come from, you know, a long history of just understanding of and, and profiling of a certain cell type. So for example, for Tregs, we have FOXP3 as a known master transcription factor that's involved. Um, and so we use this sort of um, information to help us to identify cell types. So in the case of FOXP3, you know, fortunately, this is reasonably well expressed. And, you know, we can see, you know, it zeroes us in right on what we think are the Tregs. However, this is not always the case for all markers. And in fact, I would say 
most markers actually don't behave this well. Um, so for example, if you look at GATA3, this is another transcription factor marker for another cell type. Um, however, you can see that it is not specific to anything. It's being expressed all over the place, CD4, CD8, and K cells, all over. Um, and so, you know, that's clearly not helpful for cell type identification. It's hard to know why this is occurring. Um, sometimes it's because um, certain genes are just not specific on the RNA level, whereas they might be more specific on the protein level. Um, or sometimes they're just really not specific, and that's just how it is. Another thing that happens quite often is that, um, especially for things like chemokine receptor cytokines, we see very, very few cells where we have, we've detected that gene. And this is because, most likely, those genes are lowly expressed on the RNA level. And with single cell, we're really only detecting, you know, we can only reliably detect usually the, the highest expressed genes, usually the, the top 2,000 or so most highly expressed genes. Depends a lot on your technology, the quality of your data, and so on. But, you know, on average, that's usually what we see. And so these more lowly expressed genes are just not reliably detected. Um, they may actually be there, but we're not going to see them in our final data. And therefore, we can't really use them to guide cell type identification. So to kind of make this even more concrete, I'm going to work through another example with another data set. So this is PBMCs from the 10x Genomics website. It's a pretty standard data set in terms of, you know, sequencing depth, um, you know, around 2,000 genes detected per cell on average, things like that. Um, and so I'm going to walk through an example of trying to identify some T cell subtypes. So first step, usually, is to, to figure out where the T cells are to begin with, just overall. To do this, we'll look at CD3, CD4, CD8. So we can see CD3 showing up very clearly in the top uh, clusters there, uh, which you know matches up with you know, CD4 and CD8 in different locations, which looks good. However, you'll see right off the bat, actually, CD4 is showing an interesting difference from the rest. And in fact, what it turns out is that um, CD4 is expressed also in myeloid cells, which is that large cluster near the bottom. So this is a really clear example of a case where, you know, I think most people think of CD4 as the T cell marker of CD4 T cells, but on the RNA level at least, it's expressed quite highly in myeloid cells as well. So it cannot be used reliably alone as a marker in that case. So once we have identified our T cells, usually what we'll do is we'll pull them out and we'll recluster them. And the idea there is that by reclustering, you know, within just that cell type, sometimes this helps pull apart um, subtypes better because we're basically trying to cluster just on the variation within the T cells. It doesn't always work, but um, sometimes it helps a little bit. So we'll do that. And so this new plot that I'm showing is now just the T cells. And now we'll try to identify some subtypes. So first, we'll look at Tregs. Tregs are generally um, on the easier side to identify. Um, so I'll look here at CD4, FOXP3, IL2RA, which is CD25, and CTLA4. Um, so you can see, although none of these genes is completely specific, they're all kind of pointing us in the same direction of this small cluster near the bottom that I've circled, uh, which are most likely to be our Tregs. Um, so because we have information from multiple genes, we can kind of build up confidence that that's probably most likely the Tregs. But I think it's really interesting to note, you can see here how, you know, none of these is, is completely specific, even FOXP3. Um, you know, there are a lot of possible explanations for why you see expression elsewhere. But um, in any case, you can just see that basically you can't just take it alone as the ultimate predictor of Tregs. And in addition, you can see if you zoom in on, on the cluster, you can see not all the cells are even expressing FOXP3. So, you know, it's, this is why we usually take this clustering approach, because basically, you know, we can't just gate on FOXP3 because you're going to have a lot of cluster cells that, where you're not detecting it. Um, and so what you do is you rely on the cluster information where we say, oh, well, enrichment of cells here express FOXP3. Therefore, we're going to infer that the rest of them probably express it as well. Um, and that they're probably all Tregs. In any case, so, you know, it's, although there is some ambiguity, overall, um, this is a fairly confident identification of, of, of subtypes. <clears throat> okay, so then another subtype we might want to try to identify is Th2. So this is a type of T helper cell. 
uh, we can look at CD4, GATA3, CCR4, IL4, which are you know typical markers you might find in the literature. All right, well, I already showed you GATA3, GATA which is not specific and therefore is not helpful here. CCR4 looks a little bit more promising. However, um, CCR4 is actually expressed in other subtypes of CD4 T cells, and so we can't use it alone as a, as a, definitive, a definitive marker of TH2. And then IL-4 has the unfortunate case of just not being detected widely. And you know we really can't do cell type identification based on just one cell. So um, unfortunately, this was a failure to identify the subtype. Finally, one last example I'll show is you know trying to make this overall broad distinction between naive, effector, central memory, and effector memory T cells. And so usually the way we'll do this is look at um, the combination of CD45RA positive versus RO positive, and then CD62L positive and negative cells. And so if we look at these genes on the RNA level, we're showing what they look like on the bottom. The CD45, you know, RA and RO are basically isoforms to CD45, and unfortunately we just don't have that information on the RNA level in this case. Um, CD62L, you know, maybe has a little bit of signal here, but um, it's a bit messy, and so it's hard to make a clear call on what's going on. However, so fortunately, this is actually a site-seq data set, so we have information on 29 surface proteins here, which includes CD62L and CD45RA and RO. And so now by looking at the protein level information, we can see a much clearer picture about where these genes are actually being expressed on the surface. Um, and so this allows us to actually make a reasonably confident prediction about what, what um, these different subtypes, where they are in this cluster plot. Um, so I think, you know, I think SiteSeq and really just, you know, uh, methods that can bring in this sort of pro protein information are going to be really, really helpful for doing cell subtype identification going forward. And there are even methods that are being developed now that will, let you, that will allow you to combine the surface protein information with the RNA information at the same time and do a joint sort of clustering on both of those pieces of information, which generally results in you know more clearly defined clusters, which makes the whole process a lot easier. All right, so you might be thinking, uh, well, what about automated cell type identification? So I think this is a really exciting area and something I've been paying a lot of attention to. Um, I, I do hope that someday this will be the answer to this question. However, um, at least right now, I have yet to see evidence that automated annotation is ready for prime time. So I think the figure that I'm showing here really illustrates that. So this is from a recent um, benchmarking of cell type automated cell type identification methods that came out in 2019. One thing I should say is, you know, this field is moving very quickly, so already a paper from 2019 is probably quite out of date. So there may be improvements here. However, you know, what I want to direct your attention to is in this plot. So they're showing um, the performance of various different methods on different tests. And you can see if you look at the inter data set um, test and then look at the deep annotation level, so right in the middle, that column. You can see across the board, all methods are doing very poorly on this test. So basically, in other words, when you try to use one training set to classify a completely separate, separate test set, so that's the interdata set um, test method, um, and then try to do this on a deep annotation level, so subtypes, no method is able to handle that right now. Again, it, there may be improvements since this paper, but uh, basically, this is where all the methods, this is a real pain point right now. So we've tested several methods um, in-house and, you know, including um, SVM method, which was the top performer in this benchmark, as well as the Surat transfer anchor approach, which we found also performed almost identically with SVM. Um, and so what we've basically replica replicated this finding where basically we, when we test, we build the classifier based on PBMCs and then test on PBMCs, we see good performance. But then when we try to generalize this to another data set, it's a bit of a mess. Um, so for example, I'm showing here that same classifier that was trained on PBMCs, but now applied to the human kidney atlas data set. So this contains, um, so I'm showing here the CD45 positive cells. So you can see that there are basically a lot of non-immune cells in this data set from the kidney. 
And of course, you know, our PBMC classifier doesn't know anything about non-immune cells, so it's not going to be able to classify them. However, we would expect that because we have a threshold on probability for classification, or basically anything that isn't high confidence enough, we mark as unclassified. One would hope that all of this other non-immune stuff would be classified, would be marked as unclassified. However, this is not the case. What we see is basically these things are all being classified as T cells and apparently quite confidently because otherwise they wouldn't have passed that threshold. So this is, you know, unfortunate. I guess not, maybe not too unexpected because, you know, it, this is a very difficult problem to try and generalize to a completely different context. One ray of hope I see is that at least for the cell types that were in common between the training and testing, we see reasonably good performance. Um, it's not 100%, but it's, it's fairly good. Um, so I think, you know, there's promise here, but what we really need are, you know, either methods that can really do a good job generalizing to new contexts, or we need um, better reference data sets so that we can have, you know, the right reference for any new data set that comes up. So I think a combination of those two things is where we're going to be heading in the future. So then this question of, you know, automation overall, are we there yet? I see, you know, because single cell analysis takes so long, there's always this urge to try and automate it to make it faster. I want to urge caution here. You know, I think basically we're at a point where, yes, certain steps can be automated without too much trouble, but others, you really need to be cautious. Um, like I mentioned, you know, the, the initial steps of data pre-processing is not really a big issue to, to automate. Uh, we're getting closer for the cell QC and technical effect adjustment methods. <clears throat> However, you know, when you get the cell type identification, um, I think in most cases, unless you're doing a very, you know, um, you know, even if even if you're doing PBMC to PBMC type of automated classification, you still need to be careful and check those results in a manual way because um, it's just really important to get those things right um, because you know all of your downstream analysis depends on it. So you know, I, I would say this is still an area where. Um, you know, even if you use a manual uh, automated method to supplement, you still need to do manual review. Um, hopefully, we're on our way, though, <laughs> to getting to automation here. Okay, and so, you know, just looking forward, um, I see a lot of challenges that we're going to have to face as a field. I already mentioned automated cell type identification. Another big one I see is um, large-scale integration. You know, a lot of, we do have integration methods now. However, um, you know, the integrated and corrected data account uh, tables that were produced by this are not really appropriate for downstream analyses. So we need to think about ways that we can actually ask questions across large compendiums of data. Um, that way we can actually make use of all the single cell data that's being generated and not be limited to just looking at one study at a time. I'm also really excited about multiomics integration. But like I mentioned, uh, you know, integrating Surface protein information can be hugely helpful for cell type identification, and there are many other types of single cell omics that can be done as well, so single cell ATAC seq, so on and so forth. And all of these can be potentially integrated together to give a better full picture of what's going on in the cell. We're also going to have to think about scaling up, of course, especially if we're thinking about looking across many different studies, many different um, types of omics data together. Um, there's going to be definite scaling issues that start occurring. So I think. You know, if we want to make use of all the data that's going to come out of Human Cell Atlas, these are challenges we're going to have to start thinking about. So with that, I hope I've given you a good overview of how single cell RNA-seq can be useful for drug discovery, as well as disease understanding in general, as well as, you know, some of the challenges we're currently facing and, you know, where, where the field is hopefully moving towards. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Middleton, for that uh, amazing and informative presentation. We'll now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. And if you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. And we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Dr. Middleton, our first question is, the single cell level data for every gene does not have that high quality with a lot of zeros while doing an in-depth analysis. 
how do you bypass this while making sure the analysis is correct? And the second part, do you perform any kind of imputation as well? Yeah, so this is a really good question. Um, and it's something we pretty much always have to deal with with single cell is that we're not going to see information on all of the the RNAs that are there. Um, so I personally do not use imputation at this time. Um, I think that this is something that in certain situations might be useful, but I think it needs to be used carefully because you're essentially introducing smoothing over your data. And depending on what you'd like to do, that may or may not be an ideal thing to do. Um, I think possibly potentially with subtypes in particular, that might be problematic if you end up, you know, kind of smoothing away this more rare subpopulation. Um, you may actually not see it as clearly. Um, it, I, I should say though, you know, I haven't experimented with that personally, so I can't say for sure exactly how it behaves. Um, I, an important thing to note with you know, the missing data problem kind of with single cell is, especially when you think about target discovery, you know, you if you are directly comparing um, between healthy disease, what what's changing and you're using single cell data, you know, you're only going to see um, changes in genes that you actually detect, right? And so you're introduced bias into your target discovery where you're only looking at the most highly expressed genes. And this is a pretty big bias, you know, you're, and that's only like 2,000 genes that you're looking at. Uh, I think to some extent, the focusing on cell types first can alleviate this a little bit because, you know, you, you first figure out the cell type hypothesis. And then you can also look at, um, on a whole, what's going different in that cell type on the pathway level. And then maybe you can infer, well, any gene in this pathway is probably relevant. And so hopefully, you know, you, you can use that to generalize to more than what you've actually detected. Uh, you, can, you can apply this, of course, as well with just doing direct differential expression between healthy and disease. Um, so I think approaches like that are important uh, when thinking about the drug discovery aspect of this. Um, but overall, I think, you know, dropouts and just missing, the, the, you know, lower quality data are things that we just have to deal with with single cell on a case-by-case -case basis because it's often quite different for every data set. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. So our next question, what would you say are the most common bias when interpreting these types of data? Right. So um, there are a lot of different biases that come with single cell RNA-seq. And I think we just talked about um, the problem of, you know, detecting the most highly expressed genes, right? So you're, you have a bias there. Um, another thing that can come in with cell types, especially. So when thinking about um, cell type proportions, um, you know, not all cell types are equally well captured in single cell. So some don't survive well during the dissociation process if you're working with, say, a tissue. Um, it, it depends a lot on the technology you're using, but there have been many times shown, actually, with different tissues um, that certain cell types are being kind of selected against when you do single cell. Um, and this is potentially very problematic if you're relying on cell type proportions for information about the disease. Um, so there, there are certain situations where doing um, nuclear sequencing can help with this. So this has been done to some extent in kidney, for example, um, because it's basically been shown that that helps with detection of certain cell types. Uh, it gives you kind of a slightly more representative sampling. Um, so I think this is something that's going to vary, again, you know, depending on your sample and what you're doing. So it, it's something to keep in mind. Thank you. So we, have, we do have time for a few more questions. I do want to remind our audience that the questions that we're unable to answer today and those that come in during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the email address that you prov provided at the time of registration. So Dr. Middleton, moving on to our next question. Regarding the changes in cell type proportion on SCRNA-seq, don't you think that the stochasticity that comes from the sampling of cells that end up being sequences make the proportion not trustable at all? Yeah, okay, so this is, that's a great point. So there is absolutely a lot of heterogeneity, and because of you know, the issues I just talked about, there can be variability in what cell types are sort of um, being you know, captured well from experiment to experiment is something subject to batch effects. So you end up with perhaps 
a pretty large amount of variability in felt type proportion from people. And maybe if you sample the same person twice, you know, you'd see something slightly different every time. Um, and you know, on top of this, this can also be if you're sampling from a heterogeneous tissue, the actual location you sample from will affect what felt type proportions you you get out. And really, I think the best way to address this, if this is the approach you want to take, is to sample a lot of people. Um, the more samples you have, the more confidence you can have. You know, the more power basically you have to detect differences between groups. And so this is the approach I would recommend. And in general, I think having larger sample sizes in terms of biological replication, so you know, additional donors, um, is one of the most important things you can do to improve your single cell analysis because there is a lot of variability no matter what you do. And so having more biological replication on donor level, so not talking about more cells but more donors, is really the level of replication that you need to address that. So th that's what I would recommend to, to just help you to deal with this very, this kind of unavoidable variability. So it looks like we have time for maybe one or two more questions. So here's our next one. Regarding automated cell type identification and the most of cells being annotated uh, is because some methods like Syrah anchoring actually don't have a threshold for the probabilities and it assigns the highest probability as the labels even if it's, for example, 0.3. Yeah, so I think that is the default behavior of the transfer anchor approach. Uh, what we what we did in the analysis I showed was we had added um, an additional probability filter on top. So you know we basically filtered it such that I think I forget the exact probability threshold that we used, but basically if it was below that threshold, we called it unclassified. And so this was happening despite that. And I, if I remember correctly, it was quite a high probability threshold, like 0.9 or something like that. Um, and so really, you know, they, these cells are being pretty confidently <laughs> identified as T cells, which was surprising to me. And it was difficult with raising that threshold to get to a point where, you know, we were um, correctly marking those as unclassified without having too much of a negative effect on our sensitivity for the cell types that, you know, we, we were actually able to annotate. Uh, so there's a trade-off there. Um, and, you know, just adding the... Um, the threshold is not enough to address it at the time. You know, like I said, though, there's a lot of ways we can improve upon this. We can have a better reference set. You know, if we use the kidney data set as a reference, I have no doubt that this would perform a bit better. Um, the key point, though, really is just, um, you know, even with better performance, I think this is still something we need to be careful with at the moment because, you know, the performance is, is not 100% and you want to make sure that your cell type annotations are as accurate as possible. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Middleton, for that answer. So we've got a couple more minutes so we can squeeze one more question in. Assuming that we have three single-cell RNA sequencing data sets after we do the clustering on the first batch, can we use the other two batches to validate the clustering result? And how can we do that? Okay, so I'm interpreting this as you have done annotation on one and you want to apply this to the other data sets? I'm not sure if I'm interpreting the question correctly. Um, I mean, so one way to do this is basically, yeah, I mean, you can use, so you could, um, you know, annotate each one separately and then try the transfer anchor approach and see if the annotations you get by transferring one to the other are accurate. And then, the, the, you know, that accuracy level should generalize for more batches within that particular study that you're doing, assuming you know nothing changes too dramatically. Um, so you can do that to sort of give yourself some confidence um, for your annotation. I, I think that would be a pretty nice approach. And really, there's no better reference for automated annotation than another sample from your same study. Um, of course, I would recommend using multiple samples, not just one. Um, but uh, you know, that's going to be, that's probably going to give you the most accurate results overall. Thank you so much, Dr. Middleton. Um, do you have any final comments for our audience? Uh, no, nothing, nothing in particular. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk, and, you know, I'm happy to follow up 
um, more, you can uh, find my, you know, contact me on LinkedIn or um, if my email address is posted here somewhere, but I'm happy to talk. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. We would like to once again thank Dr. Middleton for her time today and her important research. We would also like to thank Labberts and our sponsor, 10X Genomics, for underwriting today's educational webcast. You can view the webinar on demand. Labberts will alert you via email when it's available for replay. That's all for now. Thank you again for joining us, and until next time, bye-bye, everyone.